Hello City Life Church and welcome. We are so happy to have you here today. Whether you're joining online or in person, we have an encounter just for you. So here are a few things that are happening at our City Life Church family over the next few weeks. That's right, welcome everybody. Well, as you know, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16 tells us to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances. And that's exactly who we are right here at City Life Church. We are a praying church. And so I'm excited to announce that we have our next prayer evening happening right here at our Lone Hill location on the 1st of October from 6 to 7 p.m. You don't wanna miss it. It's gonna be an absolutely amazing hour of prayer and fellowship. So we cannot wait to see you at our next prayer evening. Amen, that's right, our viewer church. We also have our baby dedications coming up. And this is such a wonderful way to just commit your children to the Lord. So if you're interested, you can go on over at our welcome desk or email info at citylifechurch.co.za. So for our Clearwater location, this is happening on the 20th of October, Sunday. And for our Lone Hill location, this is happening on Sunday, the 27th of October. That's right, church. You don't want to miss our awesome baby dedications. Well, I'm super excited to let you know that we have awesome opportunities for you to serve right here at our um, Lone Hill and Clearwater locations. So if you're interested in serving, there are so many ministries that you can get plugged into. Um, we have our welcome desk, our hosting team, we have our worship team, we have media, camera operations, and of course, City Kids. So if any of these ministries sound like something for you, why not get plugged in? It's an awesome time to serve the Lord and make friends. So if you're interested in serving, all you've got to do is head on over to our welcome desk straight after this encounter. Alternatively, you can email info at citylifechurch.co.za. That's right, everywhere. Church, seeing as this is the year of open doors, we've been hearing so many different wonderful testimonies and we really just want to encourage you to please participate and give us more testimonies from you. If you're interested, you can reach us at testimony at citylifechurch.co.za. Well, church, that brings us to the end of our church news. We hope you have a fabulous Sunday and awesome encounter and we'll see you next time for some more church news first I just want to start by saying that God is still in the business of doing miracles even today I know sometimes it seems a little abstract that the same God who created the earth with just a word from him is the same God we serve today that the sea parting God is still the same God that we experience today Sometimes we need to be reminded of that, that he is still in the business of doing miracles. I mean, a couple of months ago, husband and I are going through a difficult financial week, as everybody does. And you know the only solution at times is to pray. And we've been praying, praying on Sunday, praying on Monday, praying on Tuesday. And sometimes when you're praying, it's like things are actually getting worse instead of better. And you're like, God, are you really listening? And at that time, I remember specifically that it was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday that we prayed because on that Tuesday, we came to the prayer meeting. You know when you've been praying, but you're still in the house of the Lord? When you're feeling despondent, but we still go to the house of the Lord. And you're thinking, God, I need your answers and I haven't seen your answers, but we still go to the house of the Lord. Tuesday prayer, Bazalai. And we arrive. As we get here, Jason, I call him the messenger of the Lord on that day. You know when God brings the guy in the church to be your messenger, he uses anyone. And Jason arrives, gives my husband a makeshift white envelope with money inside. And he says, somebody left this here for you one so They said, I must give it to you. They actually gave it to me on Sunday. I've had it since then. And you realize that while we've been praying, God had already provided for something that Bazaloni, we didn't even know we needed that Sunday. Before we even needed that money, before we even knew that we are going to be having a very prayerful week, He had already touched somebody somewhere to provision for us for things that we do not know of. Your miracle, God is still in the business of doing miracles. But it took obedience from someone who heard the Holy Spirit speaking to say, do that. And the thing is, sometimes we don't know the impact of our offering. We don't know the impact of our obedience. We don't know the impact of our offering. 
Because as much as they could have given it to him, I got blessed. My household got blessed. Our kids got blessed. All because of the impact of one person. And the after effect is that because of that blessing, that catapulted us to start praying and interceding for someone. So do you understand that somebody somewhere gave and was obedient, but it triggered prayers and intercessors of people that they don't even know to start praying for them. The impact of your giving, the impact of your offering. Church, what you don't realize is that you might be giving to the Joseph Project, but there's a child somewhere who needed God to come through. And through your giving, that's a miracle. What you don't realize is that you're giving today as an offering, but there's somebody that needs to come to the house of the Lord to hear the word and change their situation and give their life to Jesus. You don't realize the impact of your giving, but God knows. And that's why when he instructs you, your obedience has a ripple effect on the people around you. So when Luke says in 6 verse 38, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with this measure you use, it will be measured to you. Church, you might not see, you might not know the impact of your giving. But the God who leads you and guides you knows and understands. Let's stand on our feet as we get ready to give. There are many ways that we can give. We've got the banking details on our screen where you can give via EFT. We also have Snap Scan for the QR codes. And our lovely host will be coming around with the offering baskets. And if you want to use our card facilities, we have them at the welcome desk. And as we give, may we be reminded that the God who sits on the throne sees more than what you could ever see and does even more with what you give. Let's get ready to give. I want to prophesy this morning because I'm believing today, not my words, but His words are going to change your life. You know, God sometimes needs us to see some things in the natural to understand what He's doing in the background. Because I drove into this church after a meeting on Thursday afternoon. As felt by the Spirit of God, I need a, I, I'm not that guy that takes thermostat readings in my vehicle. And I take this picture on the screen and it's like 31 degrees on Thursday afternoon. And I'm man, man, we are well into spring. It is September, but it's feeling like summer. Anyone know what I'm putting down? The very next day, <laughs> our nation looks something like this. Come on. It's like snow everywhere. And if I didn't see it, let me help you, I wouldn't believe it. If someone said to me, you know what, it's 31 today, but tomorrow there's going to be snow all over the place, I wouldn't believe it. But sometimes God needs you to see snow in the middle of spring, that when He sends a river to your desert, that you would believe that He is who He says He is. God says, I'm about to bring some rivers in your desert. I'm about to make some pathways in the wilderness where there seems to no, be no way. My God can make a way. I believe there are people here this morning that you're feeling overlooked. You're feeling unnoticed. You came to the house. You came and you thought, you know what? I'm not even going to dress up because it feels like I am hidden. You've been hidden in your job. You've been hidden in your family. And if you're honest, it feels like your whole upbringing, you have been hidden. Pastor Bianca and I in the shops this weekend, kind of pre, pre payday shop. Anyone know what I'm putting down? And we're putting some groceries in, in, the, in the basket there and walking around. And I see this mug. I am a stickler for a good mug. Must be a pastoral thing, man. In fact, this mug said world's best pastor. And I thought, I know my church would want me to have this. Come on. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's just the right cup, it's the right size, everything about it is just awesome, man. And I'm like, I need this cup in my life. And I grab the cup and I put it in the trolley. Pastor B, she's got a mind on her, she's going and calculating, she's like, you can put that back. And I'm like, cool, no problem, right? And she said, some of these other things we also got to put back, right? 
I've looked at the budget and everything, and I'm like, cool, cool, cool. But I really wanted some of these things. Some of these things, it was like the last few items on the shelf. So I don't want any judgment in the room right now. I take some of the like sweets and I knew they were the last of that kind and I thought, cool, I'll put them back. Don't, no judgment in this room. I put them back, but I tuck them round the back. I put like, I put like the, the, the nougat bar and the, the granola bar in front of that good looking chocolate right there. And then I take the cup and I'm like, ain't nobody else getting my cup, come on. Don't judge me like you never done this. Right next to the mugs is all these pots and they three pots back. No one has touched those pots. I can see the dust on them. I pull the one right out the back and I put that cup in that, in that pot and I just tuck it right back there. Because come payday, I'm coming back for my cup. Come on. Some of you all done that in the, in, the, in the clothing stores. You've been at Edgar's, you've been at Jets. like, mm, this is, fits real good. I'm just going to put it in the kids section. I'm going to put it in the, behind these jerseys back here. Don't look at me like you've never done that. You see, the greater the value, the more need to hide it. Some of you today have said, God, I feel hidden. And he says, I'm about to release you. You are hidden because of the great value, the great call, the great anointing, and the great need I have to use you for the kingdom of God. Come on. God has hidden you. God took Paul after he had the encounter with Jesus. He sends him away to Arabia for three years. Moses, you know what he does? He puts him in the bulrushes. Jesus, he says, no, you're not going to be born in Jerusalem. I'm going to put you in Nazareth, a one-horse donkey town. Because out of a hidden place, I can make some great things. God has hidden you because He has anointed you and He is working in the background to release you when He needs to release you. Come on. Our passage today, we're going to stand for one moment. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. I wrestled with the Lord on this because I'm like, Father, I don't know if I want to preach a word on this. And God says, my people need it. So I want to be obedient. It says this, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common, say common, to mankind. And God is faithful. Anyone ever experienced the faithfulness of God? Anyone right now have a testimony that God has come through? You thought it was impossible. You were trusting God at a prayer meeting for resource. Meanwhile, God in the background, He's already made a plan on the Sunday. Hello, what a powerful testimony. We can give God praise for His faithfulness. This part is harder to shout about. It says this, He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, say tempted, He will also provide a way out, say way out, so that you can endure it. My message today is entitled, The Escape Plan. Father, in this house, I take control of the atmosphere and I declare that this is an atmosphere for the miraculous. This is the atmosphere for a word to be released from heaven. Not my word, but your word. Lord, I pray that I may decrease and you increase. That, Lord, you would speak to the desolate places of our soul. That even in this place today, those who have raised a prayer, those who have raised a prayer card, those have made a petition with a joyful heart, that, Lord, we declare yes and amen over every prayer in this house represented on these prayer walls. We say yes and amen in a year of open doors that it shall be opened for every Every person that has been battling against past demons, I declare in this house the final nail on the coffin of any generational curse that has plagued your family, your parents, or your life in the name of Jesus. Lord, would you come and move today? The atmosphere already thick with the presence of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Can we right now just put our hand on the shoulder of someone around us? And I want you just to, in an appropriate way, if you're able, lift up your brother, your sister, the person on your side. Maybe it's your spouse, a family member. And Father, right now, over the person on my left or my right, 
I declare the favor of God, the blessing of God. That as it was with Samuel, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I thank you of my brother and my sister, God, that you have a word today in season. And so, Lord, come and have your way in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Can we give the Lord one last shout of praise? He's worthy, He's good, He's on the throne. And you can take your seat. Escape plan. Escape plan. I want to speak into a space this morning that is often a difficult space. And I think it's kind of the word that many pastors and preachers would avoid because it's a word that we need to hear but so often don't want to hear. It's this word about how to navigate when temptation comes in your life. If we were honest as we sit here in this place today, has anyone in this house ever been tempted? And has anyone in this house ever fallen to a temptation? If you didn't put your hand up, the Bible says you lie to yourself and you fail to accept the truth. Because you and I, we've all been tempted. We've all fallen to temptation. But Paul wants you to know that there ain't no new temptation you're facing that someone has not already fought before you. You may say, but I'm fighting with technology. The temptation was that you were fighting against distraction. It's the same principle. It's the same temptation. It just comes in a different form. This morning, I believe, and I want to shake some shame of people that felt today, I don't even know if I can come to the house of God today because of the shame I'm feeling, because of the sin or the temptation that I fell to. I want to tell you today that you may have a different temptation to a person five people down the row from you, but it's the same grace that you and I can access. It's the same love of God, His grace poured out in this place. And therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus in this house today. We will all face temptation, but we all need the same grace of God. Maybe your temptation is what you do in response to feelings of loneliness. Maybe it's your thought life. Maybe it's things that you feel you need in your life that you're frustrated, haven't materialized, and you walk and move towards a substitute, but now you feel locked and trapped by the very temptation. Well, I got good news for you. Say good news. God is about to set some people free in this house today. What you came in with is not what you are leaving with by the Spirit of God in Jesus' name. See, the reformers, they spoke of, because the Bible says that the rain falls both on the righteous and the unrighteous. The reformers understood that we are all deserving of a common grace because we are human. I'm not referring to salvation grace, but a common grace. And Paul here is speaking that we all have a common grace and a common temptation. We will all face very similar temptations that will come to us in different forms. I want to say to you today, be encouraged because there are people who have fallen to temptations and they look around this room and think, I bet no one else has ever fallen into that temptation. You look at your life and say, you know what? There were some assembly parts in my makeup that I feel have been missing or lacking. Let me help you. Just because your temptation looks different to someone else's doesn't give us room to judge them. We are all needing, deserving, and having access to the same grace of Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you this morning, His grace is here. The way forward is here. The way out is here. And God's about to set some people free in Jesus' name. See, for many of us, if we look at our lives, we may have aged, but age hasn't meant that the temptation has changed. It may have changed its form, but the devil often will still trip us up in the same way. It's the same need for approval. 
It's the same need for validation. It's the same need to fill a longing in our soul that if we were honest, we know in our heart of hearts that actually it's only God who can fill that need. See, it may change its clothes. The temptation may change its form, but it will not change its nature. It's the same temptation. So many of us in our lives are saying, God, I'm waiting for your presence. I'm waiting for your breakthrough. I'm waiting for a miracle. And in the absence of the hand of God, we choose an escape route that God never designed for us. And so what Paul, I love the word of God because the word of God comes rushing to our aid. And verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10 is actually the conclusion of the first 10 verses. And Paul wants us to know that God is greater than your situation. He is greater than your sin. He is greater than your shame. He's greater than guilt. He's greater than condemnation. And today, my friend, he is greater than the thing that has a hold on your life. He's about to set some people free. Come on. And so he starts this passage by actually going to the story of Egypt. He starts in verse 1 about telling them the oracles, the story they knew so well, this factual part of Scripture of how the children of Israel navigated Egypt. But the story of Egypt actually started from a positive place. Because when we read about the story of Egypt, it was in Egypt that the house of Jacob escaped famine. It was Egypt. When the famine hit Canaan, God had already set up Joseph in a place called Egypt. Is there anyone here grateful for the fact that our God has already sent people out there to set us up for success in our future? Come on. There are people right now that have been set up for breakthrough for us. Your name has been mentioned in board meetings that you weren't even a part of. There are people that God has positioned to pass through the paperwork where there has been a bottleneck for far, far too long. God positions a Joseph in Egypt that you and I can escape a famine that we're dealing with right now. And so the house of Canaan, it moves down to Egypt. Joseph says, bring my dad, bring him along for the ride. And he sets him up in a place called Goshen. And Goshen is a place of provision. Other people are navigating a drought, a famine, but the children of God are eating the fat of the land. God set them up, not just in the fat of the land, but they're eating Kentucky Fried Quail. Hallelujah. They got Quail McNuggets. I don't know what they got, but God has set them up in a place of abundance. But sometimes we have to move when the Spirit of God moves. Because in the same way that Joseph departs, the same way that Pharaoh departs and new Pharaohs step in, suddenly the special relationship is forgotten. And the very place that they escaped to becomes a place of a prison in Egypt. So often in our lives, the very places that we run to, the temptations that we escape to, that can provide hope temporarily becomes the imprison that enslaves us. And we wonder why we are trapped. We wonder why we do the things we don't want to do, even though we don't want to do them. See, sometimes the place you go to escape to will be the place that enslaves you. See, I want to break this down. Some people here today, you've been escaping just for survival. As a pastor, I know that there are people here, maybe not here at City Life Church. Let me distance this a little bit. I have dealt through the years, Pastor Bianca and I, so often with young people with huge callings, huge potential in the kingdom of God. They are going along. God is doing miracles, but their singleness becomes the trap of temptation. And instead of trusting the timing of the Lord, they take the relationship status into their own hands. Let me help you ladies. If the guy on a dating app says his relationship with God, it's complicated, 
That is not God's best for you. Hello. That is not the one. That is not the anointed one. And some people would rather than being alone, be in a relationship that God didn't want them in. They would rather be with someone just to have another presence, even if the relationship is dragging them back to a place of slavery, an abusive relationship, a difficult relationship. They would rather go away from God than to God for fear that God wants them to be alone. See, sometimes we miss the goodness of God. We must understand the faithfulness of God. We create our own way out when God says, if you would wait, I was just about to do it. Come on. I was just about to bring what you were looking for into your life. See, the problem is sometimes the things we run to to medicate with end up being the things that master us. If you've been stuck in a cycle of temptation, you would have proverbially gone to a medication that now is mastering you. You would have said, you know what? I'm just taking one pill a day. And then suddenly it doesn't satisfy. Two pills a day, three pills a day. And the very thing that you thought would medicate the difficulty you're in becomes master over you and you become trapped like the children of Israel in a place called Egypt. You've been there too long and I want to tell you today that ends in the name of Jesus. God is about to take you forward. He's taking you out of Egypt. The one thing about God, when you're faced with a place called Egypt, it can feel like there is no way out. The children of Israel came to the Red Sea. They've got the Red Sea in front of them. They got the Ferrari chariots of the Pharaoh coming behind them. They are stuck between a rock and a hard place. Rather than God lifting them over it, he will often choose to give you the strength to go through it. In this house, we need to realize that God wants you to go through some things because when you go through it, the, when you've been through the valley of the shadow of death, it's not just the shadow you remember. When you've been through the valley of the shadow of death, you know that God is actually a shepherd. You heard about him, you've seen him, you've read it, you've heard someone else's testimony, but when he's taken you through, you know the character and nature of your God. He is a good shepherd. He will take you to green pastures by still waters. But sometimes we have to go through the Red Sea. And Egypt, this proverbial picture, is a place of entrapment. Egypt is a place of bondage. Egypt is a place where people are in chains. They fed you quail one day and they shackled you with chains another day. The temptation met your need initially but now you're bound to it. And because of the repetitive cycle of temptation at the age of 10, at the age of 20, at the age of 30, it's created a neural pathway in your mind that even when you don't want to go down that route, that's the route you're going down. Because you've built a path to the enemy in your life. God's about to ruffle up and shake up some neural pathways today. He's about to build highways in a desert. You thought there's no way there was another way out. You felt trapped. God says, I'm about to make a new road in your wilderness out of the temptation that you're in right now. Paul says this in verse five. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. They didn't die in Egypt they died in the wilderness. Our greatest battles, the battle of temptation. This is Paul, a few verses before our main verse saying, it's in the wilderness that you either make it or break it. It's in the wilderness that actually you can overcome temptation. But we need to understand what Paul is actually saying about the wilderness. Because some of us, if we were honest, we would think that the wilderness is the relationship that went bad. We would think that the wilderness is actually a place where we lost our job. I want to tell you, the wilderness can happen any day, at any moment, on any part of the week. 
<laughs> it's so funny. So often I'll, I'll, I'll be chatting to Phil and I'll say, hey, Phil, how was your week? And I'll just stop doing that. Why? Because how do you summarize a week? Anyone ever feel like this? That on Monday, it's like the land of milk and honey. But Tuesday comes, it's the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Philistines, the, 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 every ite against you. How was your week? Well, it can go hour by hour, minute by minute, because we will all go through the wilderness. See, Paul is saying here, the battle of temptation is a place called the wilderness. But he doesn't leave us there. That's what I love about Paul. He doesn't leave us in a place without hope. You see, it's in the wilderness that the children of Israel wanted Egypt. They wanted to go back. Oh, mm, that place of garlic. Anyone ever craving garlic? Cucumbers, oh man. If I could just have a cute, different taste, different generation. But anyway, they were wanting something, but the reality is, is they forget that Egypt was the place where Pharaoh commanded them to make bricks out of mud without straw. What is that? Your temptation is a picture of disempowerment. You cannot make bricks without straw. God's saying through scripture today, your temptation will never fix a need that only I can help you navigate. It's gonna leave you frustrated and 30, 40, 50, 60, it's the same temptation, just a different way. And their bodies were strewn a cross in the wilderness. And I'm declaring in this house today, no person of City Life Church going down in the wilderness. Come on. Ain't nobody gonna suffer with a temptation that takes you away from Christ. Because Paul gives us the solution. See, the Bible says, and I love this, this is why Scripture, interpreting Scripture is the way to go. The Bible says that you and I, we got a great high priest. His name is Jesus he is the picture and the personification of God. He is the second Adam. Before him all things existed, and by him and through him all things hold together. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is a provider. He is the great I am. He is who you need him to be in every time of difficulty. And Jesus, where was he tempted? types and shadows. Jesus was tempted in a place called the wilderness. For 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus fasted, but he had to go into the wilderness to release grace to the people who have been bondage to temptation here today. You see, when you look to Jesus, when you invite Jesus. You see, you thought you could fight the devil on the wilderness, but it was Jesus who came down on our behalf and he called the devil to the wilderness for a rematch. In the right corner, weighing in 80 kilograms, but scrawny, funny looking, the devil. In the left corner, weighing in at 180 pounds, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the anointed. There was no battle, but he came into your wilderness to give you a victory over temptation that you and I could never do in our own strength. He is mighty. He is El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. He's coming today into your temptation with love, grace, and not just to coddle you in it, but to bring you like the children of Egypt through the wilderness in the promised land, the place of divine grace and provision. See, Jesus, he knew that the devil would hit him with three temptations. You thought there was a whole bunch. The Bible says, there are only three temptations that you and I will face. Two John, one John, sorry, two verse 15. The first temptation, it'll come in different forms, is the lust of the flesh. In other words, what's the flesh? It's the emotions, it's the feelings. Man, I just don't feel like going to church today. I just don't feel like eating the healthy stuff. 
Man, God, I wish you'd help me lose weight. Man, I'm picking up my stomach. Whoa, man. But you know what? Let's get another debonairs. Ooh, Romans 149, bonus round. Come on. Anyone know what I'm putting down? Come on. Don't tell me you haven't had a Romans special. Don't look at me like that. Debonairs, 179, two pizzas. Our family is fed. Hallelujah. But Lord, please make us lean and slick. It's the lust of the flesh. The second one is the lust of the eye. Many of us think this is about woman and it's about sex. And yes, it can be. But the lust of the eye really means to only see things in the natural. Some people have been so disappointed in life that cynicism has been the tempter every moment of their life. And they sit here today cynical about the things. Is God really going to move though? Is he really? Is that really going to come through? Because the burn of disappointment has left you in a position of trying to push away any hurt that you think you will have by not trusting in God. See, some people here today really need to realize that that temptation of the eye is real. Jesus said it's better that you pluck out your eye than fall into sin. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. Come on. Because he understands The eye deceives us into believing this is all we have. And I want to prophesy over this room this morning. I look out at this room and I see fertile soil. I don't say people say people are problems. I say people are potential. I want to tell you you're about to germinate. There's seeds in your life that are just on the cusp of germinating into a multitude 30 60 and a hundredfold in Jesus name. he's about to birth something new can I not do it says the Lord forget the former things do not dwell on the past he's about to do a new thing bump your neighbor tell him he's about to do a new thing even on a cold Sunday we abandon in Auckland He's about to do it. He's about to do something. Don't give up. Don't give in too soon. The third test that we face is the pride of life. Doesn't matter your age. It's the same three. If you look what the things you are falling into every single time, the Bible says it's summarized into those three things. See, Jesus, he's fasting 40 days. He's hungry. And the enemy comes to tempt him. Jesus was tempted on your behalf to give you the victory against the tempter. It was a repeat of the Garden of Eden. Is, uh, what if you eat of the fruit of the tree? Surely God wants to hold something back from you. And so the devil comes to Jesus, 40 days fasting, 40 days in the wilderness, and he comes to him and he says, would you turn these stones into bread? What does that mean? Would you eat things that actually won't satisfy you? What is temptation? It's a substitute for everything that God has for you, but it comes like fast food. It comes on our terms when we need it, when we want it. And sometimes God says, you just got to trust me. He says, no, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word of the Father. He doesn't even put the attention back to him. He places it back on his heavenly Father. The second temptation in the wilderness. If you throw yourself off this cliff, that will not God send his angels to hold you up. What is that? It's a picture of the pride of life. It's a picture that says, you know what? If God ain't going to do it, I'm going to be a self-made millionaire. I'm going to be a success. It's the shortcut. It's the idea that, you know what? If it is to be, it's up to God in that moment said, no, I'm not putting God to the test in this area. There's one area we can put him to the test in finances. But he says, I'm not putting the Lord to the test because God is faithful. And if you know he's faithful, you don't need to test him in this. Come on. And so he backs back the temptation of the enemy of trying to prove to people who said you would never amount to anything. People who spoke death over you. Parents who said, why are you not married? Why do you not have kids? Why do you not have that car that I thought you would have by now? That you, like Jesus, can say, you know what? My hope comes from God. I will trust in Him. I will trust in His timing. I don't need to be someone important when God calls me his son or his daughter today. And the third temptation, the lust of the eye. The devil, 
brings Jesus to a place, a hilltop, and he shows him in the distance the kings and the kingdoms. And he says, you can have all of this when? Right now, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus in that moment realizes the devil wanted to tempt him from gaining what he was called to do by shortcutting the place called the cross. Sometimes in our life, when it comes to temptation, what is the cross? The cross is a picture of denial. The cross is a picture of saying, not my will, but your will. The, picture, the cross is a picture of saying, Christ in me, the hope of glory. The cross is a picture of saying, God can do above what I could think or ask or imagine but it may feel like temporary pain. Sometimes, church, we have to give up on something we want right now for what we want the most. That was the temptation. Oh, man, if I could just, you know what? I've done my maths. If I cut God out of my finances, I can afford the car that I believe God wants to bless me with. Don't look at me like some people ain't never done that. But you know what, God? It's not about a car. It's about you getting the glory. It's about you taking this life, this vessel. And as it was, you know, the victory of Jesus was not at Golgotha. The victory of Jesus was at a place called Gethsemane. He walked through the cross into victory because he navigated his Gethsemane. Gethsemane, the place of pressure. Gethsemane, the place of crushing. Gethsemane, the place where the oil is released. That you and I would say, you know what, God, I want this so bad. God, I want to go. I want to take the shortcut. God, I want to take my route. God, I want my exit plan. And you come to a point like Jesus in submission to him and say, God, Not my will, but your will be done. Not the way I want to see it roll out. And for some of us today, if you just let go of some things, that pull, that neural pathway, and say, Jesus, man, I so badly want to go down this road. It's mastered me. And you say, Jesus, King of heaven, the one who defeated the tempter in the wilderness on my behalf as I sit here in my wilderness, would you remind the devil that he is defeated? Would you remind the devil right now? I'm letting go of how I feel. I'm letting go of how I want. I'm letting go of thinking I'm everything. And God, today I declare you are everything. You are my all. Jesus, come on the scene. And when you do, he shows up as the mighty lion of the tribe of Judah. Come on. Enemy is looking for a target. Enemy walks around like a wimpy lion, seeking those that he can devour. What is he looking for? The one who feels isolated. You are not isolated. You are not alone. You are not lonely. The temptation is not unique to you. No, we all have faced the same temptations. But today in your wilderness, Jesus is about to show up to show himself strong on your behalf. If you believe that, give the Lord a praise in this house today. Give him some worship. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not taking a shortcut. Come on. Jesus, after 40 days. Why was 40 days important? Because Jesus did in 40 days what the children of Israel couldn't do in 40 years. A tenth of the time. A tenth of the time. God's saying to you today, you can keep on going to the vice, you can keep on going to the thing, you can keep on being a slave to it, but in my house, in my kingdom, I have called you free. This morning, I want to declare over you, you shall know the truth and the truth's about to set you free. There is freedom in this house. I shake off shame in the name of Jesus. We have all been tempted. We have all fallen to a tempter. But some of the repetitive cycles, the neural pathways end today in Jesus' name. You can stand up in this place right now. For those of you who are wondering why I wear a hat, this is why I wear a hat. 
because it's probably like not even 10 degrees, and I am sweating like T.D. Jakes. <laughs> and please, I am not a T.D. Jakes. I want my people free. We can come and praise and show the part, dress the part, do the things on the outward, but there are some battles the Lord has spoken to me about in this house that I don't need to know, but I do want to guide you out of them. Many lost their lives in the wilderness, and your life will not be lost to a temptation. Your life will not be lost to a tempter because your Savior, Jesus, came down from heaven and He fought. He took out another round. He asked for a rematch and He defeated the enemy. Next time, you know what you're going to do? You're going to bring the Word into your situation. If you are perpetually stuck in the same repetitive cycle of temptation, what Word are you going to stand on? What did Jesus do? He stood on the Word of God. It is written. He understood. Listen, Jesus was able to defeat the enemy in Matthew chapter 4 because of an encounter in Matthew chapter 3. It's the goodness of God. The Bible says He came to John the Baptist. He went through the waters. And as He stepped into the waters, Heaven opened, a dove descended from heaven. Who is your enabler? Not by power, not by your might, but by my spirit. He sent the dove, the spirit down. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are ministering in this room right now. And then the word from heaven wasn't one of judgment. It wasn't one of task this is my son in whom I'm well pleased I declare shame off everyone in this house Jesus is looking at you today he is so proud of you when God looks at you he sees Christ in you the hope of glory and you thought He's coming with a stick. He's thought he's coming to sort you out. You thought, if I keep on doing this, I'm going to be exposed. He's not going to expose you. He wants to take you by the hand and lead you out of the path he made himself through your wilderness. The Bible says he has been tempted in every area as we have been tempted. If Jesus fell short, we would have no one to look to. But today... He's the GPS that's guiding you out of what you're going through right now. We all face temptation. We all face difficulty. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will provide a way out so you can endure it. Today in this house, I declare over the beautiful people of City Life Church, you are not leaving with the vices. Yes, He may come to tempt you, but you are not falling for His trap again. With every eye closed and every head bowed in this room, I believe there are many people that if you are honest with yourself, there's some things that you just want to say, Jesus, could you take care of this? Jesus, could you help me in this area? If that's you, would you lift your hands right now? No judgment. This is a place of grace. I believe a lot of people's hands should be up right now. Father, right now, I speak shame off people. I thank you for the grace of God, the goodness of God, that when you look at us, you're proud of us because of Christ in us. And Father, today I thank you that you've already fought the devil in our wilderness. You've come through clean. You've made a way. You've made a path that you and I can walk through it. This will not be the rest of your life. You will no longer be pulled to the same temptation as what you did when you were a teenage boy, a 20-something young girl. Shame off you. Because the Word of God says there is therefore no condemnation for those in Jesus Christ. For every person with their hand raised right now. 
hands raised is a picture of surrender, but it's also a picture of freedom. There's no shackles holding you back. There's no handcuffs holding your hands behind your back because today with your hands raised, you're free. Speak freedom. I pray even right now, Lord, that you would give a word that we would stand on. Thank you, God, that you're giving us something solid to stand on. No longer walking in the shame of that temptation, but you will walk in victory in the name of Jesus. I don't want to rush this moment. We're just going to sing a chorus because I think for many of us, we just need God to solidify this moment. Come on, let's just sing a chorus right now. Thank you, Jesus. says even young people stumble and fall but those who wait upon the Lord those who walk in the revelation that he's already fought the battle in the wilderness will mount up on wings like eagles the same thing that used to trip you will now project you the same thing that used to trip you up will now project you into all God has for you I declare it today in the name of Jesus with every eye closed and every head bowed in this moment, you can put your hand up. I do not want to rush this moment because it's the most important moment. I spoke of a common grace, but there is also a salvation grace. Because the Bible says that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. There is an eternal life to gain an abundant life, the side of salvation to walk into. And it is only found in one name. His name is Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life you've been looking for. And today, He would stand at the door of your life, of your heart and knock. Would you let Him into your life today? I want to encourage you. He knows you. He loves you. He loves you right now as much as He ever will. He's a good father. Your earthly father may have been absent, may have let you down. That is not who God is. He is good. And today I want to encourage you, if that's you, it's time to come home. Maybe you were saying today, you know what, Pastor, I did that a, a long time ago, but I've, I've fallen into traps. I've gone my own way, but I, I've come today. I want to thank you for showing up today because today is the day of salvation. If that's you today, I want to give you the opportunity to come home like the prodigal son. And so today, if you're inviting Jesus into your life for the first time or the first time in a long time, I'm going to ask you to do a bold thing with no one looking around. On the count of three, just to lift your hand up so I can include you in my prayer. This prayer is important. I need to know who I'm praying for today. One, He loves you. Two, He has an incredible plan for your life. And three, would you lift your hand up right now? Thank you, sir. Thank you at the back there. Thank you in the middle. Fantastic. Thank you on the side here. Thank you on the side here. There's someone. Can you keep your hand up? They're just putting a, a Bible in your hand. 
you can keep your hand up, but I, right now, if you've lifted your hand, I want you just to pray this prayer with all of us today. Say this, Lord Jesus, I come before you today, and I ask you, Lord, to come into my life. I choose you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Forgive me of my sin, both past, present, and future. Today, I choose to follow you all the days of my life from this day forward in Jesus' name. Can we give those people a round of applause today? Come on. All of heaven is rejoicing. Hallelujah. Come on. Church, I want to close with a, a final prayer over, a prayer of blessing. I want to encourage you, if you got Monday off this week, well done. Wise person, come on, long weekend ahead. Otherwise, enjoy Tuesday, but I want to pray this blessing over you. Don't forget Tuesday night, there is no prayer meeting. Our staff have been burning the midnight oil with events and conferences, and we want to honor them with a public holiday. They can spend time with their family this Tuesday, but we will be back the following Tuesday. Don't miss church next Sunday. Father, I thank you for the beautiful people of City Life Church. I thank you, Lord, that they are anointed and appointed, that they are highly favored, that they are a force to reckon with because of Christ in them, the hope of glory. And I thank you, Lord, that though the week may be shorter, they will accomplish more. The 40 days is better than 400 days, 400 years, 40 years. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, for the favor and grace that they may prosper and be in health even as their soul prospers in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have an incredible weekend. Spend time with family. God bless you as you go. Yeah, my.